here we go. It is December, so the antlers are out. Uh, it's a famous Books and Bars attire that I wear. Welcome to Books and Bars, everybody. It's seven o'clock, so um, come on in. If you're here for the first time, I will place some instructions in our chat about how to do this, but it's pretty simple. For the most part, I ask that everybody remains muted until I call on you. So you can raise the little blue hand and it lists everybody in order that they raise their hand. I will call on you, unmute you, and then you can make your comment or ask your question. That way we won't uh, have everyone talking at the same time. So um, thanks for everyone being here tonight. Uh, we are talking about Fleischman is in Trouble by Taffy Brodeser Ackner. Uh, this book is was considered like last year's book of the summer. It, it, it was quite the rage. I posted a few articles and interviews about it. Um, I don't know if, if you were caught up in the, the frenzy that this book had uh, when it was first out in um, hardcover, but uh, it, it, it garnered some attention. And I'd be, I think it's gonna make for a really good discussion tonight, whatever you thought of it. So um, you may be familiar with some of Taffy's celebrity writing. She writes really um, kind of infamous and well done celebrity profiles for GQ before writing this book. Um, one of the ones that she got most attention for was a piece on Tom Hanks. Another one was a piece on Gwyneth Paltrow. They're both worth reading. Um, she has a knack for finding that she doesn't really ask a lot of questions. Um, she really just kind of tries to get the other person talking and reports on, on what they said. And uh, she kind of applied that style to this book in the way that it ends up being not a celebrity, but a profile um, of, of a few different people, of one character in particular. Um, so she's an American journalist and author. Um, she has worked freelance and is a contributor, as I said, for GQ and the New York Times. Um, she's a staff writer at the Times. Um, her profiles of celebrities have won the New York Press Club Award and the Mirror Award. Um, she recently turned 45. Um, she's from New York. Uh, she's married with kids. And uh, at the time of writing, she bore um, a pretty good resemblance to some of the characters in this book, maybe especially our secret narrator that we find out at the end. Uh, and uh, she talked about sort of the genesis, the idea for this coming from uh, how, um, you know, maybe somebody who gets divorced um, becomes like the talk of the of the school or like the school drop off, you know, like uh, the rumor mill sort of thing. And and what you what's true and what's false about what's really going on in that divorce that you maybe only know one side of and not both sides. So um, what I'm interested in is, of course, what you guys thought of it. So um, let me again post some stuff in the chat here to remind everyone how to do it. But I would love to see some hands up. And I will call on you and tell us what you thought of it, especially if anyone maybe just finished it and has a really fresh take on it. I finished this a little bit ago and uh, I could use um, a refresher. And it's not about what I thought anyway, because I, I wanna kind of keep that back so I don't influence uh, what you guys wanna say about it. So do we have any hands yet? Anyone uh, with their hand up? And also, do I have my co-host, Lisa? I always have, ah, I see my co-host, there she is. I'm gonna make her my co-host tonight in case anyone needs a little extra tech support from us. Okay, so uh, if not, I'll continue on until somebody has a hand up. But I see Kevin's back and Kevin's hand is up. I'm so excited. Kevin, I'm unmuting you. Talk to us, please. Well, hello, Jeff. It's been a few months uh, yes, since I've been back. here. But, uh, thanks. Um, I do try to read all the books, but I just can't make all the, uh, all the gatherings. But uh, anyway, so. Um, I did, I finished this book on Monday, so I finished it very recently, um, and I did not care for it. I thought uh, it was, um, I, you don't have very, or I mean, you know, the books get picked how they get picked, but, um, and I, I'm happy to read any of them, but it, to me, it felt a lot like kind of reading day-to-day -day life. Like it was, it was kind of bland. It was kind of like, okay, these people show up and they just kind of live their lives and you know, they, I mean, they live in New York, they're rich New Yorkers, and um, it didn't, it didn't have the tension that I was looking for, it didn't have the kind of the drama, so I was a little, I was a little disappointed. Um, I could appreciate the writing, the writing's solid, you know, it's fine, but there wasn't, to me, there wasn't much to the story, so. Um, thanks, Kevin, and uh, absolutely fair. Um, let me ask you this, um, do you have any, any close connection to divorce? 
Uh, I have been divorced. So yes, okay. I've been through that. Um, although it was not, um, it was not very traumatic. Um, I don't, I haven't been in a personal situation that, um, where I feel like there's been a, uh, an emotional breakdown in the way that, um, you know, clearly that, um, that Rachel was having. Um, so yeah. So, so I, okay. yeah, I mean, I guess I, you know, yeah. I'm, I myself have, have fortunately not had a close connection to divorce, you know, more uh, distant family um, and stuff has, but, um, but I'm wondering then if you, you mentioned maybe Rachel had a breakdown, do you feel the same way once we find out maybe the other side of the story? And, and, and is, it, is it that Rachel had a breakdown uh, or could something else answer that? And you don't have to answer this, Kevin, I'm throwing this out to the group, but, uh, but I appreciate um, your thoughts on it. And uh, if anything else comes up, please bring it up. We got a bunch of great hands now. I see Rebecca's hand is up. Rebecca, talk to us. Hello, hello, and Hi. shout out to Allie. It's so good to see you. So happy to, to see you back at Books and Bars. You gotta, you gotta come every time now. Um, I'm going to agree with Kevin that I um, was not a fan and I, I wrote down my thoughts because I wanted to explain why. I can see that it is a well-written book and it should hit all the things and lots of good reviews, but one, it's not a book for single people. I don't really care about the inner workings of a marriage that is not my own. And so that is the, I, I had trouble, I guess, identifying with. Um, the speaker, uh, the, 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 the author. Um, we spent a lot of time getting to know, oh, what's his name? Um, uh, the, Toby? Toby, thank you. And, um, and at first he's a good guy, but then the deal breaker for me was when he fired Mona, the, the uh, care, caregiver, and then justified it later. So I realized that basically he had an arc. First we were on his side and then we were we ended up being, kind of being turned against him. Um, I wish we'd had the same kind of an arc with his wife uh, because all we got to see her was crazy time. And so I don't know whether or not she was as crazy as, 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 as depicted. And the final thing, um, this book actually reminded me of how Jonathan Franzen writes, which is stuff so much detail in there um, that you, you're seeing a slice of American life at a specific time. And, and, and it, it feels like this should be awesome, but all that happens in Jonathan Franzen's novels for me are people thinking kind of uh, silly thoughts in their head and, and, and uh, thinking that that's profound. So those are my very strong opinions. <laughs> and and Rebecca, remind me, how did you feel about Franzen? When, were you with us when we read Franzen? Yes, I hated did, it. Okay. I and, I, it. and I loved the Franzen. And I remember, I couldn't believe how many people didn't like the Franzen. And I really liked, we read Freedom by Jonathan Franzen. And I thought it was phenomenal. And I, and I was very surprised to find that most people disagreed uh, with me on that one. But I, I, I've since realized that he is quite polarizing uh, in general. And, and that was just one that really hit me and I liked. Um, mm -hmm. But uh, OK, thank mm -hmm. you. Uh, we'll it has come to back. reflect your experience. And I think yeah. you might have more things in common with both France and perhaps uh, Toby. So uh, you know, I don't know. <laughs> well, well you are married to a woman much, named Rachel, yeah. right? <laughs> yes. But I hope I don't have too much in common with Toby. Uh, and I hope if my, my wife, Rachel, probably uh, would really hope I, I didn't either. So, um, but yeah. Uh, okay. Kara's hand is up. Kara, I'm muting you. Please talk to us. Um, not only did I not like this book, <laughs> but it might be my least favorite book that we've read this entire year. Awesome. I've never. We've got to have one. I was so angry. Um, it made me furious. I never once thought that Toby was a good person. I think from page one, I was on Rachel's side. And not that I thought Rachel was a good person, but like, I hated Toby so much. And I questioned every single thing he thought and did. He had some moments of sympathy as a doctor, but like, he was such an um, awful, awful, disgusting man. And I hated him so much. And I thought like, the point was like, 
you know, they were going to finally in the end show like Rachel's perspective and be like a double switch, but it ended up being like, she also kind of just sucked. And so it was like a book of just people who suck again. Like you don't have to like all the characters, but like, I deeply hated all of the characters, including his friend who like is the author's like self insert. I thought she was bad too. Um, but it was just bad. Um, my God. Like there is a passage where um, Toby's treating that patient who's in the coma and he has admonished his like residents a couple times about how like, you know, you need to like always be compassionate and like, you know, look the family in the eye and stuff like that, which sure I agree with. But then at one point he's talking to this lady's friend and she shows him pictures of their trip to Vegas. And he's like, I just thought she was like a smart and intelligent woman. I never pictured her doing anything like that. Like she looks like those women in the dating apps. Like she's like a party girl. She's like, I don't think he called her a slut, but that's basically what he's thinking. And then he said, I had to like look away from those photos to think of her as a person and as a patient. And I was just like, hated him so much. I hated him before that moment, but like that moment, especially I was like, he's also a bad doctor in addition to being a bad person. Um, and then I took a screenshot of another passage that made me furious um, where it's, I don't remember her name, but it's the, the friend who's like the woman friend of Toby's who is like, works for the like magazine aimed at men. So I viewed her as like the author of the book because of how it all ends. Um, but she says, uh, the only way to get someone to listen to a woman is to tell her story through a man. Troja Trojan horse yourself into a man. Um, I realize that all humans are essentially the same, but only some of us, the men, are truly allowed to be that without apology. The men's humanity was sexy and complicated. Ours, mine, was to be kept in the dark at the bottom of the story and was only interesting in the service of the man's humanity. And I was like, okay, so this rich white New Yorker is writing this about how like poor women are so oppressed. Like, I was like, lady, that's to just essentialize gender that way and to not admit that like so many men of color and trans men like also have their humanity erased and to act like you could never tell a woman's story when like white women have like the second amount, like the second most amount of stories told about them. I just, I also disliked her and I felt like we weren't supposed to dislike her. So, oh man, I've been talking too long, but I'm fired up. I was so furious. No, you're not talking too long. That's great. I think uh, we're going to have a hot, a hot one tonight. This is very exciting. Uh, I see Elise's hand is up. Elise, I'm unmuting you. Talk to us. Hey. Um, you know, I felt like, I think this was the author's first book and I feel like she had a lot to say about Toby and took almost the whole book about Toby and wove Libby in there. And then all of a sudden it was Rachel's turn at the end, but she ran out of steam. I mean, the part about Rachel's perspective was so short and I felt so overlooked. And um, I have actually been through divorce. And one of the things it reminded me of, because I thought about this often is that, um, you know, there's person A, there's their perspective, and then there's person B. And I actually think there's a Sometimes there's a whole different thing that actually happened that neither of them actually remember anything about it that was truthful, that there's like a whole nother being there, which is the truth of what happened. So neither of them re remembers any kind of reality at all. So I feel like there just becomes this whole other reality that isn't true. So. Did you take um, Lizzie's narration to be I mean, more true, do you feel like, how did she know sort of all sides of that? I mean, did you, was she it reliable? Was weird, it was a weird thing because it made it sound like she knew everything that Toby would, that Toby was doing and going through when clearly she didn't. He didn't tell her some of the crap he was doing. So I thought it was weird because first she was telling the story, but then you knew she couldn't know the whole story. And then she kind of became her own character in this, you know, in this story and in this friendship. And didn't you also get the sense that there was a point at which she, you know, she was kind of interested or flirting. I mean, she yes. was like, maybe she was going to do something with Toby, you know, yeah. and, and in the end, know, I, and so that kind of muddies the, the story did, there. It did. And I just felt, I ended up feeling sorry for her. I just thought she was so pathetic. I thought in the end that her friends, she was handy to have along and she was a nice third 
person, but nobody really looked at her. Nobody really asked her or understood anything about her or cared about her in that friendship group. So I thought that was sad. Hmm. Thanks, Elise. I see Angela's hand is up. Angela, talk to us. Yeah, I have to agree with the majority of what I'm hearing. This is not my favorite book. Um, it was easy to fall in and understand the characters and stuff like that. The whole book seemed really whiny though, like poor me. And not just with him, not with just Toby, but with Libby. And you could just see all the frustrations. I also hated the fact that it made it out to be that every marriage must just be horrible. And there's all these things that lead down and the fact that that's what they're telling Seth. Now, do I think Seth was choosing the right wife or whatever? No, I think he was doing it just because it was the thing to do at his age or whatever it was the next progression step. Um, and I thought that was kind of weird, but it was like, oh, every marriage you get bored and everything changes and things do change. I've been through a divorce. It was very amicable. It was fine. We still chat every so often. Um, it doesn't have to be hateful and it felt really hateful. Um, I also did appreciate the realness of the children because let's face it, I spent a lot of time with other people's 12 year old to 16 year old daughters and they are all like that. Oh, everything is so embarrassing. And my nephews and the boys, I, boys groups I spend time with, they're always so happy and excited and less embarrassed for a little bit longer. Um, so I liked that dynamic uh, quite a bit, but it did feel very whiny. I didn't like the whining and the negativity and it was emotionally draining. Well, the way we're going right now, I'm wondering if all of a sudden Glass Hotel looks like one of the best books that we've read. I thought that one was, that was a tough one. Seems like this one, I'll be interested to see um, how you guys rank this versus Glass Hotel. And especially because we're, we're, we only have one more book this year. So you'll be able to, by, by next time you can tell us Worst, worst read of the year, books and bars, and best read of the year, books and bars. But we have Evelyn with her hand up. Evelyn, I'm unmuting you. Talk to us, please. Hi. Um, I, I, I kind of want to come up into defense of this book. I have long been a fan of uh, Taffy Broadister Ackner, and um, I thought it was brilliant in many ways. Um, I I mean, I think what Elise said about some of the flaws, I felt like the, the chunking was a little bit off. Like I would have liked more time with Rachel. Um, but the way I read it was, it was the whole thing was tongue in cheek. The whole thing was tongue in cheek. Everything that I read it as Lizzie was, or Libby was, she's the friend, right? She's Toby's friend she understands some of his flaws but loves him as a friend or maybe more we don't really know maybe she's not really sure um at some points but loves him as a friend despite all of that and so her perspective is through a lot of understanding and so she as the narrator tolerates and takes for fact everything that toby tells her um that's how i read it and so like the whole first half that's toby's perspective is her saying what toby said to her and so like it's and she's like learning this like as we go along a little bit and as kara said like or I, who was talking about the arc somebody was talking about how there was an arc for toby and he just got kind of worse and i think it's lip Libby like kind of realizes like oh shit my friends are not that great I think and especially when she you know finally meets runs into Rachel at you know looking really bad and she does like she helps her out um yeah and I think she she comes out of all of this I think very confused and kind of sad in a way like she, she made this whole excursion. She sort of has abandoned her family for part of this book to like go hang out with Toby and help him and be whatever. And in the end, I think she realizes what I had was okay. Even if like 
it is like going to Disney World with my family and looking really dumpy and whatever with the rest of the people in the neighborhood and like but it's still like what but I don't think she's like she's not like a very positive person to begin with so she doesn't sound very positive but that's what what's happening I think that's what I think all right well, Evelyn, and I thought I'm it was glad. really funny overall. The book was hilarious, absolutely hilarious. Um, huge caricatures of all these rich New Yorkers who I know some of, and like, were, uh, yeah. And it was it was really that part was amazing. Well, Evelyn, I'm glad that you uh, liked it and found the humor in it. I too uh, enjoyed it and really thought it was funny. Um, Taffy has talked about how right after writing it, so many people came to her and said, "Oh, Toby is." this for sure like everyone thought that they knew who she was writing about and she didn't you know write about one person in particular but she said she felt that she nailed definitely a certain type if you're living in new york and maybe jewish and maybe a doctor that so many people were like oh yeah that's for sure so and so and she was like it's not but i'm glad i'm glad that i got it right you know and that you could maybe see something in there. Um, yeah, uh, hopefully others will find others that liked it too, but we'll see. Andrea, maybe she liked it. Did. I'm unmuting you, talk to us. I liked you it. You look like you're in a wonderful location there. Are you on vacation? So I'm not, but it's a photograph from <laughs> when I was kayaking in Italy last summer. Very nice. So it's um, along the coast of Cinque Terre and yeah. actually sitting in the view from a kayak. Um, awesome. I enjoyed it. It did remind me of Franz and um, I actually have friends like these. Um, and one of the, I thought it was smart and sassy. I was surprised to figure out many pages in that the narrator was a woman because I just had it in my head that the narrator was a man because who was Toby telling all these things to? He's telling them to a woman. I thought it was things that he was sharing with a man. I think one of the big themes for me was successful women trying to navigate a marriage when they're supposed to be running a business and managing children and managing a, a marriage. And that could make you go off the deep end. I have done that, had my own business and a crappy marriage and a divorce in the middle of all that. And, um, you know, fortunately, some witty friends to share some of the stories with. I don't know that any of the characters, I mean, they did some crazy things, but I don't know that any of them were necessarily not real, maybe composites of a lot of potentials of people that exist. Um, so I found it very entertaining. Um, maybe a little, uh, somebody said this abbreviated at the end when we got to what was Rachel doing? But the point was Rachel wasn't doing much because she just had burnt out and lost it and just couldn't figure out how to function. So that's my two cents worth. Thank you. Um, I am wondering, do, do people think that um, there's a, you know, why, why we only get a little bit of that and then what do we take from the ending? I feel the ending uh, could be read in a couple different ways. Um, I would love to have anyone's thoughts on, on what it means and, and maybe the classic what happens next sort of thing. Um, uh, the author has talked a lot about how she did encounter the issue of uh, the common thing of, oh, well, these characters are all unlikable and having to overcome that with a lot of readers uh, once again. Um, and I, I think that's tough. I, you know, I think it's interesting when she tried to write about, um, you know, what is it like when the the, the man is not the breadwinner, even though he's making $300,000 a year, that's considered, he's considered on the low end of their social um, stratosphere in New York. And he's the one that's taking care of the kids. You know, he's sort of in the, the non-traditional role. Um, and, and she's the, and, you know, she's like the superstar and how that affects things. And then how, you know, he, uh, as like everyone in this book is going through a midlife crisis of sorts, it seems. Uh, it seems, you know, like uh, they hit a certain point and they're for the first time discovering like new dating apps and, you know, they're just like living out these fantasies after being maybe locked down with a job and kids for so long. Um, 
and I think it's kind of interesting what she explored there also. So uh, I'm happy to see Pete's hand is up. Pete, talk to us. Oh, hey. Yes. Hey. I was trying to hold out uh, and see if I could go after Donna for once. but uh, Well, yeah, I, I saw in the chat, myself. we're trying to let all the women speak first. But you know what? There's so <laughs> few men in the books and bars chat sometimes that it's really nice to pepper it, you know, every once in a while. So, so uh, you know, in order, it was okay, Pete, you can go now. <laughs> Courtney and Donna will go right after you. Yeah, and I, I, um, I really appreciate Kara's comments because the the um, and that's what I really kind of love about this format, or you know, book clubs in general, is it is a book that I really enjoyed. But I like, but I think the emotions that it invokes, like it, yeah, I would I, if uh, if, uh, if I'm a woman, I mean, well, I mean, I'm, the best I can, my best personal self, is to to. Um, yeah, I'm enraged by this stuff of like the the injustice of so much. You know, the the, the poor poor Hannah. You know, she's just exploring uh, bits of her young uh, uh, physical self and and gets abused by these these awful people at the camp, and she's blamed and sent home. I I really that that. That, that really it enrages me but that's what i loved about the book is like i thought it put out all the injustices a number of injustices and then on the personal side that i um uh i in in my youth i was dating someone who was uh living at 86 and third and the upper east side and saw a lot of that life in there and uh i was so happy the moment I set, set foot in the Midwest in 1993 in my shitty apartment in Uptown. And uh, I would never felt more at home when I got away from the East Coast. So uh, I think she describes everything I experienced there. It's like, there's a lot of vapid stuff. And I thought it was really funny how she captured that Toby's this somewhat accomplished doctor. And He's, he's just a piece of shit because he's not in finance. That part just cracked me up. It's like the, um, the, 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 the most soulless people on earth are New York finance people. I mean, you're just, um, uh, you know, more money for more money's sake is just the uh, uh, epitome of what, what's wrong with, with things and why it's so delightful here where, um, uh, where I'd, I'd and what and also interestingly where a place i didn't connect with the book and this would be a good uh, follow-on topic with you jeff is that like where the author and i posted her an interview with her with jake trapper at the very top of the chat yeah. uh she was she she was fascinated by divorce in this uh, longish interview um and because her parents are divorced but i think she's in a in a in a marriage, it doesn't seem like it's headed that way. But the the subject of divorce was fascinating because when she turned 40, all of her friends and, and friends that she was at weddings at were uh, suddenly getting divorced. And then they were showing her these apps. And that's where a lot of this stuff comes from. Right. And uh, where uh, I think a lot of this, and it's a great first novel. I, I give I give authors huge passes on a first novel. It was like, all right, you can practice your craft a little here. But the, that she brought so much of that in was just her own personal experience of what dating is like. And that would be, I mean, I, actually, I, I, I don't want to know what it's like because it sounds horrible. But the uh, um, poor people dating these days, like, you know, thank God for like activities like books and bars or something <laughs> that you might be able to find a, a viable human somewhere. But the... Uh, um, and, and one other thing, too, that you mentioned in that interview, I think is real interesting here, and then I'll, I'll uh, uh, take a cup of shut up, is the, uh, uh, the Karen Cooper character, she re uh, the author researched that disease very specifically, um, and she landed on it because um, that it could have been detected way early and saved her life if someone would have looked in her eyes in the last few years. And yes. 
And that part of that interview that's at the very top is really moving to me because like it it kind of plays out the tapestry she's driving at here is that um, where and that like Toby listen to your patient but he won't listen to Rachel if people would just listen and be kinder to each other and like, simply listen right just um, take in what other people are saying and don't don't comment judge on it just listen and take it in there might be a whole lot less misery out there so i think that's where that's why the book landed for me because i think it's a it's a prescription for happiness more than it is you know through the journey of misery of all these people thanks pete uh great points i also uh watched some of that jake uh, Tapper interview with her. I almost posted that one today, but I, I think I posted the one with um, the other author, Emma Straub. Um, but I've heard her talk about some of the same things where uh, it really was key that that with it, um, the disease that that woman had was that no one had looked her in the eye in so long. Like, And it was just, it took someone actually just looking her in the eyes and acknowledging her and seeing her. And then, you know, it was, it was caught, um, but it took so long because people weren't doing that. Um, and uh, let's see what else in that. Oh, she talks about, yeah, the, the dating app thing. Um, she admits to being, this is the author now, behind on a bunch of things. Like she said, you know, I wanted to write about The Bachelor for GQ when I watched like season 16 on a plane. And I was like, this is incredible. Is this what everyone's watching? This is so great. I got to tell everyone about this. And they're like, <laughs> um, yeah, like, you're like really late and she felt the same way when she realized about dating apps she's like what people are doing they can just press a button she's like you can watch tv and then decide who you're gonna hook up she's like this is incredible we gotta write about this and everyone at gq was like um yeah that's what everyone has been doing for years now like you're married like you don't know you know kind of thing and and so then she was like well i'll just go write a book about it you know, because I can't, I'm not going to be able to write like a piece about something that I just figured out um, sort of thing. Like it just blew her mind and, and she wanted to write about that in some way. And she but, did, yeah. she did talk to like some sociologists and some other, and uh, some other professionals about <clears throat> what these trends are doing in relationships. And, and what's interesting is I was in, in a, another book, it's like that, um, uh, that, that, it was a survivor story, that woman that was, uh, there was there was three women that, or three or four women who were raped and one of which is in Montana. It was kind of a famous story, but they uh, were, um, uh, the young man that was, she grew up with even, uh, where uh, he, um, his entire life experiences about interacting with women was from porn. And it was, it's just like, it leads to, it creates this horrible behavior in people that it's uh, where, um, you know, it's, it's a newish phenomenon. It's a subject of some study, but it's, it's you know, where uh, it, I don't know. I just, I, I think this, this is a terrible way to, you know, raising boys today really requires, um, uh, oh, I, I don't envy you, Jeff. I mean, uh, it, 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 it's just, it, it seems like there's, there's an environment out there that has got to get better. It should, it, it can't, it can't go on like this. Yeah, yeah you're, you're absolutely right. And thank you for acknowledging my struggle, yeah. um, Pete. Um, actually, <laughs> my, my kids are good. There, there's a, there's sort of a famous comment. I don't remember who said it, some comedian and um, sorry if it offends any, and it's not completely accurate, but, but there's a gist of it that you'll get out of this. Um, when you're raising teenage boys, you have to worry, you know, about one penis. When you're raising a teenage girl, you have to worry about many other penises. So um, yes, uh, it's tough. Um, but I would love to hear from anyone. I have a lot of hands up here. I'm very excited to see this many hands. But if your hand isn't up, maybe this will spark something for you. Is there anyone that's willing to speak about, um, you know, and maybe this is speaking to Taffy herself. You could talk about what it's like to be out there right now and using the app and dating and dating off the app 
and how that's going for you. And, and who knows, maybe you know, you'll, you'll meet someone in the chat tonight. All right, Courtney, your hand has been up for a while. I'm unmuting you. Please talk to us, Courtney. Hi, um, so I read this a while ago, so my memory is not super clear, but I want to go back to one of the things that Andrea said that I, I really agree with what, um, when she was talking about like the narrator, the voice being Libby telling the whole story. Um, and I think, so I feel like, if I am remembering correctly, it wasn't until like 30 or 40 pages that she like introduced who she was. Like, it seems like, oh yeah, this is like just Toby's voice or like just a third, third person narration. Um, but then it was interesting that it was actually Libby who was telling the story. And I, and I feel like that kind of goes back to like some of maybe even like the clunkiness of the pacing about like, why is Toby going on and on and on? And then we just get this like whirlwind couple of, you know, 20 pages from like what Rachel has been up to the whole time, because that was her lived experience is that, you know, she's got Toby talking her ear off, like just venting to her as much as she can. And so her retelling of the story is then like all of those details. Um, and so I think this is really interesting to hear um, those, um, snippets from the interview with the author about her like mind being blown about like oh dating apps and everything because I feel like that then does resonate with like you know probably Libby's perspective too of like well she's been in a, a long-term relationship and has kids and she's probably just as much about like oh my god <laughs> Toby what are you getting yourself into on these apps so um I feel like it that threw me off a couple times throughout the book like I would forget that it, who was narrating it and then it would come back and I'd be like oh yeah that's right um but but yeah it was it I feel like that was kind of really interesting how that was woven throughout throughout the story and um yeah it's it's kind of unique I, I feel like it's usually you know she was just kind of a not one of the main characters but it was all from her perspective <laughs> Yes, uh, and I think, you know, it's kind of interesting and it goes back to also what Elise said about that, like, you know, that, that, that third person being there, that there's somebody else that's part of this, um, you know, and, and it's weird because she does sort of insert herself into it. She's obviously close to Toby and at one point you're, I kept thinking, oh, they're going to end up together or something. This is leading towards how she, you know, found out that they were perfect together. Um, but a couple things, um, a lot of hands I'm still going to get to, but um, it's been it's been a hot topic in the chat. Um, and if we want to bring it to um, the forefront here is uh, Rachel going to the rape group and talking about that. And another thing from this would be, um, what do you, again, what do you take from um, Rachel showing up at the end? And what do you think happens there? Um, but we still have these hands. So if this hopefully sparked you to raise your hand, please do. Otherwise, Donna, talk to us. Donna Adams. Um, yeah, hi. Um, just jumping quickly on what Courtney said about the structure, I did find it really intriguing that, you know, you're about 40 pages in and all of a sudden there's an I or told me or whatever. And you thought, wait a minute, I thought this was third person and now there's a first person. And it took a while then to figure out oh, this is this woman friend, this Libby, and they spent that time in Israel together and so on. And I never thought they'd end up together because they said pretty much from the start that she was too short for him. He, she was too tall. And, you know, there's a whole, whole thing about how short he was, you know, that went through this whole thing. But then the fact that once she runs into Rachel, and Rachel then tells her her story, then we get the Rachel part. And you know, that's just so far um, into the book, which is why we had all that first part about Toby. And then Libby herself becomes such a big part toward the end. And we almost get these speeches from her about marriage and divorce and all of this because she's going through all of her own stuff. But um, what I, what I really felt drew me to this book was even though the first part, I, I did get kind of sick of Toby. I, I, I thought the stuff with the app, you know, and him needing that release through these sexual partners was so much of an obsession for him to the point where he'd kind of plan his day around it or, you know, figure out what, I mean, he cared more about getting the kids taken care of so he could go and meet one of his lovers, you know, even though otherwise I thought he was quite a good parent, but 
he just was kind of creepy to me that way, but he was a good doctor. I felt that part was positive about him. And then once he figures out, or he thinks he figures out that Rachel was having an affair with that, the husband of that school friend of hers, you know, that Sam, then all of a sudden he switches to having no longer any need to think of her in any kind of a sympathetic way. He's then just ready to write her off. And, you know, we find out later that that's not really what was going on at all. But my gosh, I mean, he was just incensed and he had been pretty much, you know, protecting the kids from thinking he was, um, that, that she had abandoned them or anything like that. She was making excuses for her. But then, whoa, once he thought he figured out where she was and who she was with, then he was instantly so, so negative about her. And then when we get Rachel's side, I, I really felt once we found out about her upbringing and how she felt that she was going to do everything she could to make sure that her kids had a better life. I mean, more of a, a privileged upbringing than she ever could have had for herself, that it just became maybe too much of a goal for her, but there's that whole long part in there where there, she's, she's talking about how she realized that, oh yeah, Toby, he had this job he loved and he could, you know, he, he was good at it. And, he, and when in reality, he knew when he married her that she had so much drive that he could do what he wanted to do because she would make the money and she, cause she had that ambition and that would, that was kind of a partnership. They sort of thought they were going, or she, they both thought they were going into a partnership. She thought that he should have been more accepting of that. And meanwhile, he thought she should have undertaken more of the home stuff. And, and they just got angry with each other about that. And, I thought, wow, there's something really powerful going on here about this whole description of how people are sparked to make the commitment to marry. And then they continue to be people. I mean, they continue to be growing and changing and learning and having experiences. And sometimes they don't remain totally in sync and they have to kind of keep remembering what it was that drew them together in the first place. And there's a little bit of a kind of poking at that a little bit saying, you know, what is, what is this about marriage? You have to keep reminding yourself why you're even with this person when there can be things that drive people apart. And yet there's a whole section there about how divorce is about forgetting and making yourself forget those moments that drew you together. And then realizing that you're just, it, you're going to be better. You think you're going to be better off in your old self when you're no longer married, but no, you're not the same person anymore because once you commit to somebody, then you spent all that time and any, well, okay. I'm babbling here about those sections about marriage and divorce, but I thought they were hugely insightful. And that was what I think then set off Libby and all of these things, these thoughts she had about her marriage and whether to stay in it or not and all of that that this author had a whole lot to say and i i thought you know she's telling it through the story of a man like she said she did her writing for a men's magazine but she also said at the end by golly libby was going to write her book and tell all the points of view and i thought yep you did that in real life in this book but when it came right down to it i thought that there were some insights kind of cynical you know, about relationships that I appreciated reading just because I thought it was pretty well told. Okay, that's my speech. Well, no, thanks, Donna. I, I struggled with what uh, she was trying to say because I, I think ultimately she's saying, you know, marriage is tough. Most marriages have a lot of faults, but divorce is really tough too. And if you can, if you can remind yourself 
why you got married in the first place. And you can keep, but you need to keep checking in and you need to keep that fresh because if you put it on autopilot, you know, it, it's going to go off the rails and you're, you know, you're going to end up with a divorce and, and that's really bad. Um, even though it might seem fun at first. So it's, I don't know if this is what she's trying to say, but it seems like ultimately, ultimately she lands on the side of, um, if you can, if you can work harder at your marriage, it's it's going to be better than if you just forget about it and then tr go try something new because you won't be as happy. I don't know. I mean, she's still married, you know, yeah. but I don't know. The pressures that the pressures that Rachel was under, you know, Toby thought she loved all that, that she loved those really superficial friends and all of the trappings that with the private school and da 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 going to those bit those whoop de doo events and stuff and it turned out she didn't want any of those friends she really just wanted toby to keep keep being her her friend and he didn't see that and she really felt she was doing it all for the kids and but yet she wasn't with the kids that much and anyway it, it the whole thing was just super sad i thought for her as a mom and trying to deal with all that pressure. It is a lot of pressure. Um, thanks, Donna. I see some fresh hands and I will then I will come back to the people who've already spoken. So Maura, you are our first fresh hand on the list here. I'm un unmuting you. Please talk to us, Maura. Yeah, I wanted to comment on the dating apps and that reading it, I was like, is this why I'm still single? Like, am I doing it wrong? Like, I was like, <laughs> Got a picture like that I'd be like no thank you um but then I'm also <laughs> sexual, so maybe that's it um but I wanted to talk about the rape group so I I'm a therapist and I run therapy groups and I I was a, and one of my pet peeves in books is when non therapeutic people write about therapy because it's always done very clumsily and can somewhat be harmful um and I did think like it was a bit outrageous and kind of funny to talk about how therapists like, oh, you can't get sick in August. And then I'm like, oh, but I need my August. Um, <laughs> uh, but I, and I thought it was like that kind of summarized what I thought of the book as a whole. Like I get the angle she was going at, but it's done kind of irresponsibly. Like if we're going to talk about how like women get overshadowed and their stories aren't told and like Toby is kind of the ultimate good boy, it doesn't really do any good to have it told from Toby's perspective, mostly. Um, I would have much rather heard Rachel's story or I would have just much rather not heard any of their stories, um, honestly. But yeah, everyone's kind of said how I feel. Usually I'm the I'm one of the few naysayers. So I feel like very at ease tonight. You, you feel seen, you feel yeah, like it. Finally. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, Maura, I'm, I'm not just to you, I, I don't want to put you on the spot, but I want to, I'm glad you brought it back up. I want to throw it out to the group. Um, do we feel as though, can we tell from what's written, do you believe the doctor did in some way violate Rachel or, you know, or is that not clear? And then did, does Rachel belong in this, in the group that she goes to because of what happened, whether she felt it happened or, or it, I don't know. My you know, is that a... My thoughts are the person being victimized, if they felt victimized, regardless of the intent of the action, if Rachel felt violated, totally she was violated. And I think child, like, well, anything with, at least for me personally, anything about fertility, childbirth, um, like sexual health is a very vulnerable thing for a woman to be in anyway. And her partner wasn't in the room at the time and just feeling like being lied to. I do feel that that was an appropriate place because violations can happen um, in in multiple multiple ways. And I think we're seeing that with the Me Too movement is that rape doesn't just look like one thing. There's not a perfect victim. There's not a perfect perpetrator. There's not situations in which it's okay or gray it's that like it comes in many forms but the group itself is about like women feeling you know the the kind of underlying themes not necessarily about the traumatic events themselves but the okay. impacts that those events have um and I did feel it was very irresponsible but like 
not not unheard of for a student facilitator to make a mistake like that but yeah okay thank you mara for that perspective on it really appreciate it and i got a call on rachel g in parentheses not fleischman <laughs> in parentheses classic classic way to rename yourself rachel g and to get yourself called on we know you're not rachel fleischman but i hope you're with us to talk right now yeah um i I, well, okay, so the first two parts of this book are long and hard to get through, and I almost gave up several times. I did really like, well, okay, I appreciated the third part of the book, um, and I think, I think the, the, the points about Rachel are, um, they didn't need to be as long as Toby's because she gave you in this brain twisting monologue like her point of view and you could insert it everywhere when you about Toby's story when he was given to you all along you're like oh there's that point here that Toby told you about and you're like oh that's another perspective of what happened go back to the other point where to Toby was talking about this for 10 pages and just one sentence turns that 10 pages around you know like I, I just thought that was good too um but the thing I wanted to bring up that I don't that some people are talking in the chat about how great of a parent Toby is, but I don't know if I agree with that. <laughs> I mean, I don't think either of them are good. Well, okay. I don't think either of them are perfect parents because I don't think perfect parents exist. I grew up with very great parents. I'm a very lucky person. I am very lucky. And I didn't know how lucky I was until I started getting out into the world about having such great parents. But I think he's got, they've got perfectly okay parents. <laughs> uh, they both make a ton of mistakes because like, he thinks he is Solly's savior and he is trying to like insulate Solly, his son and make him just his own little like buddy and like wants to monopolize all his time. But then it's like Rachel was trying to push for him to go to this camp and you know, Toby's like, oh no, he can't go to the camp. He doesn't want to do it. And Rachel's like, I think we got to push him. We got to, you know, put him out in the world like a little baby bird and and he thinks it's just selfish that she just wants free time. And then it turns out he loved camp. He loved getting away from it. But Toby was like, no, I, you know, oh, he doesn't want to be away from me. And like Rachel's perspective is like, oh, Solly does love me. Like he, he burrows into me all the time when we learn about her perspective. He doesn't just love Toby. He just loves his parents and he likes being with his parents. But Rachel realizes he needs to get out into the world too, which I thought was great and how, so Toby's not a great, I don't think he's a great parent either. So like, it was just more of like, more perspective about the twisted version of Toby that we get later. And you know, how, when he's dealt with any kind of reality, like when the, the person he likes to see, and he pushes her to get out in the world, but she's like, I can't because of my divorce potential settlement. He finally gets her to go out in the world and he like, five minutes with her he can't even stand because like this is reality she's not this seductive person in the bedroom anymore like I, I don't know there's so much about it and like I don't think we even brought up Seth at all like his uh the third friend of this little trio and how out of touch with reality and how out of touch with relationships he is because I mean, he, he proposed it to just, just some woman because he's sick of being single I think in the future and then like there's already trouble brewing at the engagement party because he's like high and she's like how could you get high at this moment and you know and like they're not on the same page here's another doomed relationship from this trio of just terrible people <laughs> so I don't know I just thought that you know I don't know I just wanted to just say I'm not a parent myself but I wanted to put it out there that I don't think Toby's that great of a parent either I think he's just kind of mediocre or kind of lazy and terrible all around <laughs> Fair enough. Um, thank you, uh, Rachel G. Not Fleischman. I appreciate your comments. I see Sue is at her hand up for a while. Sue, I'm calling on you. Are you with us, Sue? Sue? Sue, I've unmuted you if you're still with us. There we go. I was having trouble How you doing? unmuting. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think I saw someone just in the chat mention um i thought this in the toby section and then it by the end it kind of verified what i was thinking that she was kind of flipping 
the script on our stereotypes mm -hmm. of who the breadwinner is. Um, yep. Usually, you know, it's the dads that let their career and their ambition get ahead of raising kids. And in this case, it was Rachel. So she was flipping that. Um, I think um, I too got very tired of the Toby section. And for a while I was like, do I even finish this? Do I give up? By the end, I liked it. I don't know if I gave it a really like, but I liked it. And I saw some good um, things in it. Um, I think she's a good writer. I would definitely read more from her. And I got through it pretty quickly once I got escaped from Toby. Um, <laughs> but the thing that kind of, it was my aha moment was um, I don't recall in the Toby section, him ever referencing his research, his research grant or losing the grant it was only after that, that you found out about the grant and how Rachel felt about it and his coworkers. So that just kind of solidified that he wasn't ambitious. He loved his job. He liked what he did, but he was never going to be the one that was riding the career ladder. And so while he was a little pissed that he didn't get the promotion, I don't think it was going to, you know, <laughs> be something long term that he was going to hate. So anyway, that's what I took from it. I liked it overall. Thanks, Sue. Uh... Yeah. I think that uh, you bring up some good points. Um, and and is, you know, is the author trying to say anything about that, about, you know, it's okay to maybe switch these roles and to not be ambitious? Or, you know, was, was this part of his downfall? You know, it, do, does the rest of the friend group and their social circle almost look down on him because he's not ambitious enough? You know, it's like one of his his flaws to to some of the characters. Uh, I wonder or, if that's or do you, if you're a two career um, family, does someone always have to take a lesser role and do more of the child raising than the other? You know, can you have two ambitious people? You know, raising kids. Yeah, Just I mean, it's question. really tough. Yeah, it's tough, and uh, it's definitely a, a financial strain, and also the strain of you know, who is it then that is spending most of the time raising your children? Um, if it's not you, you have to decide that. And these are decisions that, you know, weigh on a lot of parents and, and, um, and they do mean a lot. And that's why a lot of, you know, parents do decide maybe like, you know, to put the raising of the kids ahead of the career. It makes sense. Um, Kara and Pete are back with hands up. Kara, I'm going to you. Talk to us. I feel like all of the things you guys are saying about like the choices between like ambition and child raising and stuff like make a lot of sense when you're talking about like other people. <laughs> but it drove me crazy that this discussion was happening around these people like to say Toby is like not ambitious when he's like a doctor and he's making like, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars a year. Like, I guess compared to Rachel, he's not ambitious. But like, he's like a society person and he's like, you know, a successful doctor. So I just felt like it was less about like, you know, gender and how like women can't be as ambitious as men. I mean, it is about that, but like, I don't believe that like, we'll be equal as a society when we have like an equal number of female billionaires to male billionaires. Like that's, you know, we're, we still have a bad society if that's like the case we shouldn't have any billionaires and so like to me Rachel's unhappiness wasn't like I'm a woman in a man's world it was like you're trying to be like a super rich society person you don't like any of these people like yeah if you were like a man trying to do the same thing it might be easier but like we've read a lot of books about men pursuing like power and money and they're unhappy. And so like, maybe the fact that she's trying to be like a millionaire, you know, is the real thing. And it's less about like, like, I don't know if she was like a guy, would she be happy? I don't know. Like she's trying to live in this really toxic, unpleasant world. Mm -hmm. So I just thought like it was more about like, I guess the theme we keep coming back to, right? Is that like the pursuit of like extreme wealth is just bound to make you unhappy. Um, 
but I thought I wanted to bring up we no one's mentioned it the thing I thought that was funniest and that did kind of make me enjoy it a little bit I thought the like the Hamilton parody um how she was like representing like the female Mm -hmm. Manuel Miranda I thought that was like kind of cute and like (laughs) so that was one of the like references every time it came up I was like that's like you know that's fun they're in New York she's like trying to be an agent like it makes sense that she would pick like the you know, most popular musical of the last, you know, decade to, to parody. Definitely. Yeah, no, I appreciate that. Um, and I caught that. That's, that's good. Uh, I see Pete's hand is up and Kevin, and uh, I don't know what they're going to say. I'm excited to find out because we're some of the only, only Toby likes, Toby like people in this group right now, if you know what I mean. But I will say this, I'm going to throw out, since no one else has brought it up, my take on the ending. And that is that Rachel comes back and they temporarily get back together, but ultimately they, it doesn't necessarily save the marriage or they're together that long. At some point, I think the problems might rear up again. On another side, I would love to hear if anyone believes that she comes back and they've learned their lessons and somehow their relationship works again after this. I'd be happy with that ending, but I don't know. I think I think they, they might get back together for a while and then it maybe falls apart in some time after that. That's just a thought. But Pete, talk to me about what you wanted to talk about. What's up? Oh, well, I, I can talk about that one a little bit too. <clears throat> kind of fits with other things I was going to say. But that the, uh, yeah, the ending, I loved it. I said, I, I do enjoy those Euro endings where um, it's not it's not happy. It's not Oh, we've resolved all the conflicts. Um, uh, no, but we resolved the big conflict is that uh, Rachel could finally get through her breakdown and actually visit her children. Where and then uh, that's another thing too is like I threw it in the chat that you know to- to- Toby's a great dad. Yeah, um, men get huge credit when they change one diaper right and then you know like you know I've not noticed a lot of equity in that space in my lifetime but the um uh uh, the uh I think the the bigger point that I think that I, I do like that she makes is that these um uh gender inequity problems are huge in our society. And I, I really wish we would be better at them than, than they are. And, but I, it's like me, like you said earlier, me too. I'm glad, I'm glad it's brought up because um, I get, uh, I get tired of uh, most stories of women who are elevated, who've achieved high success in in my in our our family we've had a lot of women that have done that um but it's only because there was some decent man around that uh uh, made their contributions on par with the people around them and i uh i like how this book brings that stuff to the forefront because i don't know you know sam rothenberg or whatever his name was like uh, that that narcissist isn't contributing a lot to society, in my opinion, and, and I don't care what what his salary is. It, it it seems unjust, and it's and I I do like books that point that out, and I and I think that's probably where Jonathan Francis comes up because I think he kind of pokes at that too. Is you know who's who's rewarded for how many people they help or elevate. And, you know, like if, if our society was something close to just, we'd be like, Oh, uh, she's a social worker. Wow. That's pretty cool. Um, You know, we, we'd be, we'd be elevating the correct people. So, um, but anyway, that's just why I like the book is I like people that point out that, that, that poke at this stuff that I don't like, but you know, and then here I am the uh, 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 pretty well off white liberal male. And so 
um, I've, I like these kind of books. It just makes me get back to reality. So thanks. Thank you, Pete. I'm glad you liked it also. Uh, Kevin's hand is up and he is back with us. Kevin, I'm unmuting you. Please talk to us. Yeah, well, just a, just a couple very quick points, which was, first of all, I thought this book seemed, it seemed to check a lot of boxes. Like, oh, that were kind of interesting to me. Like, it's sort of relevant. Okay, we're going to talk some tech stuff, like some apps. We're going to talk, um, you know, gender role kind of different dynamics. We're going to talk about, you know, wealthy, whether, you know, the Hamilton reference. Um, and even, uh, like, I don't know, just even the ambiguous ending. Like some of that sort of, um, those are cool elements to books. So it seemed to check a lot of boxes, but it just didn't time together in a way that was very relevant to me or very, very compelling or very, that really brought the story in there. And I think that Rachel, Rachel G, not Fleshman, um, said, yeah, you know, she said something kind of relevant too, which is the character development, like the backstory. The backstory didn't get enough for me. It was so, there was so much of the app or so much of what was happening in the present that I didn't feel connected to the character development. So I just wanted to say that, but yeah, so. Uh, thanks, Kevin. Um, I see from the chat, uh, my co-host tells me that uh, we are debating who is the better parent. So if anyone wants to weigh in on that, think maybe you're one of the children and you have a choice of going with mommy or daddy or, or just anyone to have any take on, is there a better parent of these two? Angela has her hand up. Angela, tell us, who's who do you think is a better parent? You know what, though? You notice when the kids, I don't know that either of them are the better parent. I know a lot of the chat is saying, um, you know, there's a lot of back and forth. They have two different parenting styles, which I think is what it takes to raise children. Sometimes you have the permissive, you know, the good cop, bad cop. And sometimes you have the, I want to hug you and I want to love you and I want to protect you. And you have the parents that's like, my mom was definitely the, oh, you fell down, brush it off, you'll be fine. And my dad's like, are you okay? But at the same time, if I was sick, my mom would be like, let me get you everything. My dad's like, suck it up, go get some Advil. Um, and I think one of the telltale signs is when the kids are like, oh my God, is mom dead? Where is she at? I want to go see her, especially the daughter. And I think it, it, every kid is so fickle. When mom says no, they love dad. And when dad says no, they love mom. And in different circumstances, one parent is better than the other. My mom's incredibly emotionally charged. My dad's super level-headed. So when there's something really major, I go to my dad because I know he's going to give me a level-headed thing. When I want someone to sympathize and empathize with me, I go to my mom because sometimes I just want someone to agree with me and feel bad for me. Um, and I think like that's, that's how kids play. And even as a 40-year-old adult, I know which parent I want to go to for certain things. So I think both of them actually were explained as very good parents in two different ways. Um, if I had a pick between the two, um, I guess I, I have to go back to, um, you need to be there, you need to be present. And I think, uh, I understand that Rachel was going through something and so there was like a, there was a lapse and it was, it was, you know, she, she experienced something and maybe she's gonna come back and, and be better and be different from it. But you can't, you can't do that and then not take, I mean, I guess she just figured, you know, the kids will be fine because they're with Toby, but she was gone. She disappeared. I mean, as a kid, imagine if you just like your mom, you didn't know if she was alive or dead and you didn't see her or hear from her for a really long time. Uh, and I just think that that's, you know, that's just a tough, that's a tough look for my guy for Rachel there. So I don't know. So I guess if I'm, a, you know, for the debate purposes, I'm going to go with Toby as a better parent. Disagree? Anyone feel free, raise your hand. Evelyn's got her hand up. I'm unmuting her. Hi. Yeah, I do. I do agree that over the course of like the time frame that this novel was written, right, Toby was there. He didn't break down, but like Rachel, of course, had a breakdown, right? Um, when they were both, you know, before the time frame of the novel um i would say they were they were both pretty good i would say a sign of a good parent is i don't think anyone knows how to parent maybe maybe people who are teachers know a little bit better how to like form a human can you hear me yeah no i'm saying okay. i know how to parent 
<laughs> okay. <laughs> that was what you were saying. But like, um, what, what, what I understood is they both overall put their kids before themselves, like, or at least they like did everything with the intention of supporting their children, right? Like Rachel had this badass job and all of that but she was there to like bring bring the money for the private schools and all that kind of thing and set, a, set an example for her children um and kids kids don't really care sometimes they just take it for granted um i just loved this um little quote near the beginning it says um toby's talking and he says about Hannah and he says yes her contempt for her parents which seemed manageable when it was aimed at both Rachel and Toby was absolutely devastating in its current concentration when it was directed only at him so <laughs> I just like you know they're normal kids you know and they have all their attention is on Toby because he's the only parent right now in the, at the moment but yeah all right Pete's got his hand back up Pete talk to us Oh, <laughs> yeah. No, this, the um, the parenting thing. I'm, uh, I get, I get, lots of uh, parenting compliments. Um, oh. You know, because our our daughter's who she is, and it's. Uh, uh, Slow clap cut. for Pete, everybody. Right. He's got a yeah, daughter so who golf she clap, is. It's right. all, way um, to go, Pete. Way to right. go, Carolyn. <laughs> yeah, and then uh, and. And uh, Carolyn dropped off. We had a dog that had uh, a tooth removed today, so she's taking care of her little dog. But the um, see, so Carolyn's a better parent here. Correct. And well, well, that's the thing is, is like we're <laughs> the better dog parent. <laughs> like um, I do like the discussion of who's the better parent because it brings up um, uh, again like this gender equality thing where I have lots of good friends. I have. Um, uh, that were stay-at-home dads and just because that's okay here in the Midwest that would never fly in the East Coast like in the, in the environment of this book and um, and the thing is where it's not even it's not even a thing here you know and and I another friend that uh, he has no kids but his his job is basically a nanny and uh, he's super good with kids and it's just something he likes and it's kind of you know like outside of these these gender norms are also a problem and 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 it's and it's, and it's the thing where uh uh when women are outside the gender norms it's this big fucking deal the whole world falls apart uh when a man's outside of gender and he goes oh we're all applaud applaud and that, I think that's exactly the cultural uh, beast that the author's poking at here in all the things she's doing. And that, that's why I support the book, but I, and her writing is brilliant. I really, you know, I, I've read, um, you know, there's, uh, and I also had to purge uh, read this too, because I wanted to get to Ready Player Two. So. Uh Okay, so Pete, have you read some of her other? Have you read any of her articles and magazines? Since then, uh, yeah, no, I've I've read I've read two of her articles. I've got a list of things that I want to get to. I do agree that she's she's a brilliant observer. She's a really good interviewer. Um, uh, her thing with Gwyneth Paltrow was um, was kind of amazing because, you know, Gwyneth Paltrow is like, you know rich white people lecturing the rest of society on what they should and shouldn't do is always entertaining to poke fun at. But then, but if you get at the person um, uh, like, like she does in her interview, uh, I, I think I, I like how she drives at the truth of things. So, and I think that's a piece of what's going on in this where we don't like it because there's ugly truths in 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 the story that are prevalent and we don't want them but i mean i don't want them anyway and that's where i i kind of land i i i have a lot of sympathy for kara's opinions and all oh, the others i'm sorry i'm focused on kara because i i know <laughs> it, but um but the uh the 
uh, yeah, I don't, I don't, um, uh, I don't think we're meant to like these characters. I don't think we're, there's no good person here. We're not, it's, it's a poke at something else. And I think, I think she has a good construction that delivers for that. And, and I'll be really interested in what Lisa Kloster has to say eventually. Well, I'll tell you what Lisa is. Lisa is sending me private messages because she is my co-host tonight, and uh, and she said I should bring up Scream Therapy. Apparently, Scream oh, yeah. Therapy is is being that hysterical. About yeah, scream Therapy. Some, oh some, my god! There's some requests for a B and B poster pre sessions. Hey, look, I want to get together with you guys and scream. We should go outside and yell. Um, you know, I'll tell you something. There are things like this. My neighborhood. Had been we have been we had been going out every night at five o'clock and just making noise like during serious lockdown to show like we're okay we're here, and then it switched over in the last uh, few weeks to it's just Fridays at five but we go out and we drum and we gather we stand outside like out you know in front of our house don't get too close or anything we still maintain social distance or we have a mask on and we just make noise out there and we kind of check in with each other a little bit. Um, and it's helpful. And we look forward to that. Like, it's kind of like you hear it. It's almost like the whistle blows and Fred Flintstone slides down the back of the dinosaur. But I hear pots and pans and drums at five o'clock on a Friday. And I'm like, oh, you know, close it up, walk outside, see people. And, you know, well, Kingfield, you're, you're that's, like, that's like Prairie Park Slope. You know, you're you're you're, <laughs> you're, you're, you're like where it's at. Right. I am where it's at. Yes, thank you. Thank I'm in you Richfield. I'm, I'm in I'm in the Bedford style. Hey, Richfield is the <laughs> up and coming. That's a suburb I tell people they should buy in. That's the one. That's because it's it, Minneapolis is finally moving south. And I mean, hey, my kids go to school in Richfield. Richfield's great. We, you know, we, we love it. Um, oh, really? Your, your kids yeah. go to school here? Yeah, they go to Holy Angels. Oh. Yeah. So I'll have to bleep this part for the video now because. Yeah, now, yes. Yeah. yeah. By I my can't house. Have, this celebrity uh yeah it's great well let's pete let's talk about this offline i have something else i want to talk to you about offline too so um thank you for uh for everything uh so so many great things i want to talk about um i see maura's hand is back up though so she gets she is who i'm going to maura talk to us yeah i'll just give you a little history of scream therapy yeah um it's based in gestalt therapy which is kind of out of style now because the guy that invented it was a real jerk um, but it was about like, kind of like allowing yourself to experience the emotions that you were too ashamed or guilty to experience. So there would be a lot of screaming and a lot of like pillow punching. Um, but now there's breath, like breath work, um, which does a lot of like, it's moving energy through the body, but part of it is allowing space for everyone to scream collectively and everyone to cry collectively, almost like midsummer, <laughs> um, and like laugh collectively. And it is like very therapeutic. Um, so there's tons of YouTube videos on breath work, um, and like the moving of energy and that being very empowering. And when I read that part, I was like, oh, I want to go to this retreat. Oh, but I don't want to be bougie. <laughs> but yeah, it's it's a real thing. And I personally think it's a lot of fun to do. Well, uh, I love I love any reference in Midsommar. Um, I, you know, I'm especially now I, I, I have another image in my head from Midsommar that uh, is a whole other type of therapy. You, um, and if you've seen it, there's probably a variety of images in your head right now, but uh, a lot of women and one man. Uh, good times. Uh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> great movie. Highly recommend it. Uh, definitely worth a watch. You know, I would try it. I would try Scream. I would try any of these things uh, at least once. It'd be fun, especially with all of you. Um, so many things I want to talk about, but we have a fresh hand. Tiana Mouse, his hand is up. Mouse, which one of the greatest graphic novels of all time, her last name. Uh, so talk to us. Uh, it's my married name, but I, my husband has the comic book or the graphic well, novel. He, I haven't read it better. yet. better. I can yeah. pull it off a shelf right now and show it to you. I just might. It's Talk pretty cool. Visually. Um, so back to the screen therapy, that reminds me of like a, a major theme that I saw throughout the book was like women not being heard. And I think about, you know, just the structure of the book, the first two thirds of the book, Rachel is completely unheard. Like we don't get anything straight from her. And like the eye, the um, looking that woman in the eye, how do you actually like 
hear a woman when she's saying something's wrong. Like it's just a theme that you hear throughout. Um, and I wonder if the screen therapy is somehow connected to that where she's like, fucking listen to me, like, you know, or something like I am, I need to like be heard, be seen. Um, I, I wonder if that's part of that, like going to the rape therapy group that that seemed inappropriate, but it also was like, where is she supposed to go? I think that was like, mm. showing that she was kind of struggling with like, where do I go to like be seen and be soothed and like have someone you know, acknowledge this pain that I'm feeling? That's something that stuck out to me. I like it. Uh, I could see that. Thank you. And um, yeah, um, you, you'll have to trust me. I've read the graphic novel, it's on my shelf. I'm not gonna make everyone look at it right now, but you've read it, I assume? No, I haven't. I, uh, oh, you... I, it's my married name. So it's, it's new. It's new homework for me to, to. Well, how long have you been married? Uh, a couple of years. <laughs> a couple of years. Yeah. It would take you I a weekend. I have a lot of things to read. <laughs> okay. Been... Fair <laughs> enough. Fair enough. Um, you know what? If I, if my wife, um, knew there was a graphic novel named Cayman that was considered one of the greatest graphic novels of all time, and she hadn't read it already. I would, I would put it on her on her end table, uh, on her bedside table, and just gonna uh, recommend it or something. But I'll, that's I'll cool. Put it on our li- I'll put it on my list. Okay, I just like the name. Cool. Thanks for the comment. Okay, so much stuff. I wanna, I wanna make sure that we talk about. Um, first of all, I have to be very clear about next, uh, next the next book. It's called Ready Player Two by Ernest Klein. We have read Ready Player One three times for Books and Bars. Twice because we were doing it twice, the same book twice a month. Once because it was the only book that was so requested because the turnover over the last 16 years, there's there's all different people. There's none of you were here 16 years ago, except for me. So uh, you gotta imagine that there was barely anyone with us that's the same people that read it the first time. If you were, I would love to hear uh, if you've read Ready Player One with us uh, both times. This is the sequel. I finished it in like three days. And I gotta tell you, if you love Ready Player One, you will you will enjoy Ready Player Two. If you don't know Ready Player One, you really can't read Ready Player Two. I highly recommend you read Ready Player One if you wanna join us and then read Ready Player Two. Um, but if you didn't like Ready Player One, you probably won't like Ready Player Two. I don't think it's gonna change your mind. I will say that there is a surprise, and I'm not gonna tell you what it is, but for anyone from Minnesota, there is such a great part of this, of Ready Player Two, that any Minnesotan I think will really enjoy uh, that section. If you've already read it, message me privately. I'd love to talk. I can't wait to talk to you guys about it in two weeks. but if you, if you, uh, I will say that it, it does expand on some of the ideas from the first one. Um, and you could, if you really don't want to, you could just watch the movie and then just read the book. But I recommend read Ready Player One, hopefully already have, and then, and then read Ready Player Two. Uh, and, and we'll talk about it in two weeks. Now, the bonus part about this, it's not an official Books and Bars event, but um, the way the author is doing this virtual book tour Unfortunately, I, I wasn't able to make it work for us, but what you can do is we can tune in one hour before our meeting and there is gonna be a live uh, video chat with Ernest Klein at six o'clock central time. So it'll probably go about an hour. So you, we could watch that, watch it on your own for extra credit and it'll help influence and inform our discussion. And we can, we can reference things that he said and things he was asked about uh, from that discussion. So, uh, so on the 16th, and I'll post links to it, but it's going to be through Barnes and Noble on their uh, Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube. It's a free live event. Uh, hear Ernest Klein uh, be interviewed, and you can even ask him questions if you get your question in in time. And then we will talk about it, our normal books and bars, starting at seven o'clock um, right after that discussion. So uh, should be good. I'm looking forward to it. I hope you guys like it. Uh, I totally understand if it's not your thing though. Um, you know, there's a lot of people who don't who don't like it. Uh, I'd say it's one of the more beloved books over the last 16 years that we've done. The first one was. So um, hopefully there's enough of you that agree and are excited and want to take that journey with me. I'm super excited about it. And it will close out 2020. And then we can kind of just review, decompress. And uh, moving forward, I have our books selected, the next three books after that. 
in for January and the start of February. Just today we picked February's book and um, I can't say totally why the, there's, a, there's more about it that's gonna be revealed, but it is a local author and it's um, the stars and the blackness uh, between us. And I posted some links to that. And again, all of these are available on our bookshop. Uh, and if you go to those links, you can read about the books. If you buy them there, uh, you can allocate which independent bookstores get the percentage of the profits that they share it with, or, you, or they will just distribute it to uh, their own idea of independent bookstores in our area. And then it also helps books and bars. So um, please check that out if you can. Donna, you had your hand up. I can, I can go to you, Donna, if, uh, if you still, if you want to say something. Oh yeah, I just had a question, Jeff, about Ready Player. Um, yeah. Is the movie of Ready Player One good? And if you you said people should read Ready Player One before Ready Player Two, but if there isn't an opportunity to do that, is seeing the movie a substitute or not? Uh, it it's it's a substitute. Um, it's I liked it. There's a lot of people who. I think people who really love the book who maybe didn't like the movie as much. Um, I, I thought the movie was good. You know, there's some changes that are made. I think you'd get the gist of it enough if you really, but honestly, Donna, I know the way that you read and the notes that you take, you'd be able to crush Ready Player One. And I can't, I thought you already read it. To be honest with you, I'm surprised, Donna. Donna, you, you should read Ready Player One tonight. And, and you'll be done in a couple of days and then you can start Ready Player Two and it'll be really exciting for you. I, I really think you should. And actually, to be honest with you, I'm gonna say right now, do the audio book. If you like Will Wheaton, Will Wheaton, uh, the actor, reads both books, does such a great job. He was personally asked and selected by Ernest Klein uh, many years ago to do Ready Player One. And then he was the only choice to continue with Ready Player Two. The audio book is so good, so incredible. Um, I've, I've read it, I've listened to it, both of them a couple times. And with the new one, I got the audio and the hardcover and, and, and did a little bit of both too. So, um, so if that helps you cruise through it, if anyone likes uh, audio, you can actually get the audio books through the same uh, bookshop links um, or you know from anywhere that, that you prefer. But uh, so I would just say, if you're really, really pressed for time and you still wanna join us, uh, you'd, you'd probably be okay, but the true experience, seriously, read Ready Player One. It's, it's in the Great American Reads. It's, it's, uh, it's a fan favorite. It's considered like one of America's you know, top 100 favorite books right now. So um, I think it's worth it. But you know, I, I totally get it. And I guess um, haters, um, you know, just, just be ready because uh, I'm coming with the love next time. So watch out for me. Uh, anyone else have anything that we, we didn't touch on yet? Any questions, any comments um, before we meet again in two weeks? We're easy to find Facebook, Twitter. Uh, I post these videos, edited versions of them on YouTube. Um, you can sign up for our MailChimp newsletter and I just send you something once a month with our, our picks and links to a bunch of things. So um, the stars and the blackness between them. Yes, Lisa, thank you for calling that out. That is February 10th book. Magpie Murders is January 6th by Anthony Horowitz. The sequel to Magpie Murders is out right now. And NPR just put it on their long list of uh, best books of this year. Um, I haven't read this, the sequel yet, but uh, it's a murder mystery. Uh, that has kind of two uh, mysteries in it. And within the publishing world, there's like the book that they're publishing. There's a mystery in that. And then there's the mystery outside of the book, like in the real world. And that's, uh, that's Magpie Murders for January 6th. Um, it's going to be turned into a mini series by Masterpiece PBS, uh, probably by the summer or something. And then, um, then John Irving, Sue, Finally, John Irving, January 20th, the Hotel New Hampshire uh, classic that I absolutely loved. Um, and I only recently read because of Sue's recommendation. And it, it's up there for me with, with uh, um, Owen Meany, Cider House Rules, Garp, and Hotel New Hampshire, I think are your top four Irvings. And so if you haven't read that one, do check it out. Pete's got his hand back up. Pete, I'm unmuting you from Richfield. Talk to us. Yeah, one quick thing about the birth story thing is like that um you know, like our daughter we went through that <clears throat> and but like when you experience it in real life it's um you know uh, any woman who's dealt with uh, 
30 hours of labor, six hours of pushing and ending in C-section. Um, it's, um, there's, and then uh, there's a whole bunch of other things that that triggers is all the miscarriages and um, stuff of uh, that people go through um, and, and uh, late term uh, uh, pregnancies that, that end in miscarriage. It, it's so lightly covered in our society and it's so traumatic to so many people that have gone through it. And, uh, you know, where I, I just like, um, you, you learn a you live with it, you get better with it, but the, I'm glad that she brought that out. That was, that was another thing that I really loved about this book that um, she, um, she went there and, and told that, story in in the midst of these characters so sorry to thanks go pete no I'm, I'm glad that i'm glad you took the time to to bring that up that was uh that was a really important part and um yeah having been through you know i mean as much as the dad can be through it uh, a couple different types of births uh yeah it's you never forget that that's really it's a really amazing uh Really amazing story. Um, so any que any other questions, comments? Uh, I posted that NPR list that I just brought up. It's got a lot of our uh, current picks and future picks in there. Um, I wish that book lists were uh, maybe not as comprehensive. Do you feel a bit overwhelmed when it's like the 100 best books of the year? It's like, OK, like, can I just get 20? Because I'm still working on the hundred from last year, you know. And it's like, I, if you want to see someone current, I don't know. I would rather have a little more curation. Just give me, just give me like the actual amount that I we might be able to tackle in a year. Um, but I do like that you can sort by like graphic novels and, and different things like that. So uh, Evelyn says New York Times only did ten. Well, I'll have to check out their ten. Hopefully, uh, hopefully we have some overlap with them. Um, one more thing I saw in the chat along with the screen therapy, a lot of us missing live events, a lot of us missing live music. Um, I had a great experience. I watched the American Utopia, the recorded concert of uh, David Byrne. If anyone, maybe some of you got to see it live when it was here, but Spike Lee shot this. It's on HBO Max right now. It's awesome. Like I just, I sat like really close and cranked up the stereo in a completely dark room. And it was like, I was at the show. It was so good. Uh, so highly recommend that American Utopia, the David Byrne concert film that's on HBO Max right now by Spike Lee. Um, really awesome. I wish I would have seen it live in person, but um, seeing it like this, felt pretty good. And I too have been craving that. So I've, I've been watching more like live music. It's not like I watched, you know, a few others, but I think in about six months is what I'm predicting. I'm kind of predicting that by this summer, there might be a live books and bars event. We'll see in person. We'll see. I don't know. I'm hoping for that, um, but we won't push it. But I, I hope that uh, we can continue with uh, good video chats, you know, mostly twice a month until then. And then and hopefully we can be in person when it's safe. But uh, if you're not going to join us for Ready Player Two, happy holidays. Uh, hopefully I'll see you in January for Magpie Mergers. But I hope that all of you uh, enter the Oasis with us and meet us back here in two weeks for Ready Player Two by Ernest Klein. So we'll be in touch online. And uh, thanks again, everybody. Good night. Thanks, Chad.